now we begin our, our run towards uh, Pentecost Sunday. And the theme of the reading this morning, of course, is the famous reading of, of Dalphy Thomas. And the subject is the faith in the uh, resurrection of Christ. Thank you for being here this morning, for being the, the faithful remnant. This is traditionally called Low Sunday, because so a few people come and here you are. Thank you for being faithful. Let's stand and we'll sing number 506, Our Great Thou uh, Art. Thank you for being with us on, on this lovely morning. Let us turn to page one in the prayer book as we greet one another, saying, Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. We declare together the hymn of praise saying, 
Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. The Lord be with you. We turn to the collect or theme prayer for today. And you, you notice in the words of the prayer that this is a prayer for the baptism candidates or for us who renewed our baptism vows on uh, Easter uh, we weekend. So we pray together, Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. It's a, it's a lovely, interesting little prayer. It's basically praying that we won't be um, uh, hypocrites, that we will put our faith into practice, our new Easter faith. Please be seated for the first reading from the uh, Book of Acts uh, today by Professor Doug. The first reading is from Acts chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. When the temple priests had brought the apostles, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as Prince and Saviour, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Psalms we do, and uh, and uh, say it together from side to side by whole verse beginning on this side. The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. punished me sorely, but he did not hand me over to death. This is the gate of the Lord, he who is righteous may enter. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. On this day the Lord has acted, we will rejoice and be glad in Him. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. The second reading, uh, the epistle reading so called, is from the book of Revelation. It's read to us by Cyril Pekhan. The second reading is from Epistle, Revelation, chapter 1, verse 4, until the 8 verses. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is 
and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom priests serving his God and Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen look he is coming with the clouds every eye will see him even those who pierced him and on his account all the tribes of the earth will wail so it is to be amen I am the Alpha and the Omega says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty this is the word of the Lord Thanks be to God. thank you sir all beautifully read let's stand and sing number 52 God sent his son
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Uh, let us pray. Lord, we, we thank you for the invitation that you give us to believe in you as our Savior and our, our friend. We ask that we may have faith to trust the witnesses who have given us a good record of the account of your resurrection, that we may have a strong and certain faith uh, in the risen Lord and follow him uh, and his teaching in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated, dear friends. This morning I want to share with you my, my sermon about Thomas. Uh, a couple of years ago I came to a revelation about Thomas that I hadn't never had before in, in my life. The story of Thomas is always uh, presented as a story of a story encouraging faith in spite of a lack of evidence. It's as if uh, it's taken as if Jesus is commending us to have faith, even though there's no evidence or the evidence is to the contrary. Um, to have faith that he is the risen Lord even though we haven't seen or we haven't seen any concrete evidence. And it, it's always been taught to me and, and it's assumed from the story that it's commendable to believe without evidence. And actually, I don't think the story is teaching that at all, as I came to realize. So this morning, I want to share with you my little message about Thomas and about the evidence and the significance of the resurrection. Those two words are key, evidence and significance. Well, a happy Easter. Thank you again for coming back um, and being the faithful remnant. Last week we had 71 people here, which is a, a kind of record for Easter Sunday. Normally Easter Sunday we have about 40 people. Um, it's not normally a really big Sunday in, in Morrison Chapel historically uh, since I've been here. Uh, it's normally Christmas that's the big Sunday. You know, we may get 90 people at the carol service sometimes. Uh, but this Easter we had many people came to worship with us. But you are back this morning, so thank you for being faithful. I think that means a lot to Christ. Um, 
And we continue after two years to still be living under the shadow of the pandemic, although the shadow is beginning to lift, isn't it, in some degree around the world. Way back in the year 250 AD, there was a pandemic in the Roman Empire. And we actually have documents that date from Easter at that time. Uh, and it's clear that people were trying to cope back then as they are trying to cope now still. And the kind of perspectives that they were drawing on are available to us in the letters of the bishops and the clergy at the time. And it's interesting that John's Gospel was, this reading that we read today, is one of the passages that the bishops used in 250 AD to encourage the Christians and the church leaders uh, to have hope in the midst of crisis. And I'll come back to that later. But I'd like to begin this morning with um, a lame joke. So here's the joke. Um, a completely untrue story of a man who woke up one day convinced that he was dead. He tried to tell his wife that he was dead, but she was puzzled because here he was explaining to her that he was dead. So she wasn't convinced. But he was adamant that he was indeed dead. So he had a great idea. She had a great idea. She rang a doctor friend of theirs who came over to the house to help. And the doctor brought a big medical textbook, a science book. And he took the man through the evidence that dead men don't bleed. When the heart stops, the blood coagulates and dead men don't bleed. So he took him through all the evidence and the man eventually agreed with the evidence and said, yes, okay, sure, I agree, dead men don't bleed. At which point the doctor quickly whipped out a big pin and jabbed it suddenly into the man's arm, causing blood to spurt out. And the man looked at his arm and at the blood spurting from his arm and said, well, look at that, what do you know? Dead men do bleed. <coughs> it's a little joke about faith, isn't it? And evidence. <coughs> well, the joke has a point, uh, which is relevant to today's gospel reading. I'm not suggesting that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is equivalent to the science of human blood flow. But I want to suggest that believing and doubting don't always come down to a rational analysis of evidence. Sometimes we believe what we believe without regard to the evidence because we feel strongly about it. Sometimes larger emotional or psychological factors come into play to form our beliefs. Our intuitions influence us. That is, we have a hunch that something is true even if evidence seems to point to the contrary. We feel like we're being watched, even though we have no evidence. Or we feel like it's going to be a good day, when actually the day hasn't happened yet. We, we also um, may have life experiences that influence our beliefs. Maybe we have a bad experience of church, and that forms a negative faith perspective in us. Our preferences influence our beliefs and our biases, our prejudices. And the science around this is, is actually pretty, pretty clear. Um, there's an atheist professor of evolutionary psychology called Jonathan Haidt. And he wrote a book called The Righteous Mind, in parenthesis, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. Why is it that in the West, people are so divided between right and left. Is it really that half the population are absolutely wrong and they don't know it, and the other population are right and they do know it? Or is there something else going on? We tend to make up, uh, hate says, we tend to make up our minds intuitively. And after we've decided what we think, we prop up our beliefs and doubts with rational arguments. Hate's book is an account of the last years of research into how people believe things and how we form beliefs and our doubts. 
And his basic argument is based on, on the, our research data, uh, which shows that we make up our minds, we form opinions intuitively. Now, we wouldn't admit that. If you talk to people, if you discuss with people, they won't admit my opinions are based on intuition or my background or life experience. They'll tell you, this is fact. What I believe is true. It's correct. But actually, others can see that they are biased or they're making a, a, a forming an opinion based on, on prejudice or a priori assumptions. It's very difficult to be self-aware about this issue. We are confident that we are the, the right ones, that we know and believe what we think we do because it's true. Uh, but actually, the science shows that we believe what we believe more because of our feelings than facts. It's true of progressives and conservatives. It's true of the left and the right. It's true of skeptics and religious people. And interestingly, it's especially true of highly intelligent people who apparently have a great capacity to convince themselves that their intuitions and suspicions are really quite rational. The point is, when we come to something like the resurrection, our views of faith are partly based on evidence and partly based on how we perceive the significance of the thing that we're considering, such as our life experience and how we approach the whole story of Jesus, whether we think it's relevant to us or not. The vast majority of young people today think that the story of Jesus is not relevant. Uh, even if you present a great deal of evidence to them to the contrary, that it in fact is extremely relevant to their life, they have this gut feeling that it's not relevant. The culture tells them it's not relevant. And it's quite hard for a teacher to overcome that feeling that they have, which they've garnered from the cultural world in which they live. So one way that I bring it home to them is they say, okay, if Christian faith isn't relevant, give me back your weekend. You no longer have Saturday and Sunday off. You have to work seven days a week. See, because this was introduced partly uh, through Christian faith, we have Sunday off because it's the Lord's Day. And Saturday is the Sabbath. It comes from religion. So if you think religion's not relevant, give me back your weekend. Oh, and by the way, I'll have Christmas and Easter and the other holidays as well. Uh, because, you know, holiday is a holy day. And that tends to bring it home to them a, l a little bit. But it's hard for them to accept that, fa that Jesus is, is relevant, even though it's extremely relevant. He's extremely relevant to many, many, many aspects of human life today. People often think that doubt and skepticism is really a modern invention and that ancient people were simple folk who were gullible and believed anything. This is a common stereotype that ancient people were not sophisticated and were not clever thinkers. It's only we sophisticated modern folk, we think, who question everything and who understand science. But actually, when you read ancient literature, it becomes very clear that while they may not have thought through the scientific method, ancient people were world-class skeptics and doubters. A fine example is in our gospel today. In our reading, we find the original doubting Thomas. After the resurrection of Jesus, we, we read in, in today's bulletin, you can open it if you like, back to the gospel in the second paragraph. This is actually verses 24 and 25. It says, Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And the language here in the Greek that Thomas uses is really strong. He literally says, o me pistueso, which means, no, I will never believe. It's very emphatic in the Greek. It's in strong language. Thomas has made the decision not to trust his closest friends and colleagues. That's really quite a leap. If you think about it, if the people you trust and you know the most in life all come to you all together and say, well, we've seen the Lord, we've had uh, a meal with him, we've hung out with him, he's risen, and the ladies have seen him, he, it's really true, what he told us three times has come about, he has risen from the dead, for you to then to say to your 12, 11 best friends and, and the ladies in your group, no, this is a joke, come on guys, 
come off it, it's not true, I won't believe you. That's really, really something. That's not just common garden scepticism or doubt. It's a really hard-hearted, hard-headed response. He will not believe the testimony of his most trusted friends. Now, we don't, that kind of obstinacy or hard-heartedness is maybe not as rare as, as it should be, um, but it's, it's more common than we, would, than we, we might suspect. Uh, Thomas has made a decision not to trust his best friends, his dearest companions. Who, and this is a serious subject. I mean, this is not something you're going to joke about, right? That, that the Lord, who's just been crucified, is risen and alive. Uh, and yet he, he cannot believe what, what they tell him. He is a very modern skeptic. Skepticism is not a modern invention. And when Jesus does appear to Thomas a week later, Jesus picks him up on this point of whether it's valid to believe only on the basis of one's own seeing and touching, the evidence of one's own senses. And Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And we always take that to mean, well, blessed are those who believe without evidence. But that's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is basically saying is, why didn't you believe the evidence of the testimony of your friends? In today's first reading, the Acts reading, it says, we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So the early Christians, many of them, were witnesses to the risen, risen Christ. And eyewitness testimony is a very powerful form of evidence. People are, have gone to the electric chair. People have been hung. People have been put in prison for life based on eyewitness testimonies. It's, it's accepted in a court of law. We live every day by eyewitness testimony. Our teachers in school tell us that things are true. In the 19th century, our teachers told people that the universe was in a steady state, not increasing. And the students in school believed it because their teachers, science teachers, told them. Einstein came along in the early 20th century and he said, yes, the universe is in a steady state. And everybody said, well, Einstein says it, it must be true. So we believe things because our teacher tells us. Problem is, in that case, it wasn't true, and it took a Belgian priest in something like 1927, together with Hubble, to discover that uh, actually the universe was expanding and was not in a steady state at all, and it had a beginning and an end, which is not what the science taught. So the point is, uh, though, that, that people in class simply believed what they were, were taught. Um, we believe the testimony of our teachers. That's my point. We believe the testimony of our parents. Our parents tell us that something is so, and we believe them because we trust our parents. They may or may not be right, uh, but we, we trust people. We have to. Life has to function this way. Otherwise, we wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. We wouldn't do anything. We wouldn't get on a bus. We wouldn't drink the water because we'd be paranoid that we might be poisoned. But the Macau government tells us the water is good, you can drink it, and we believe them. Have we put the water under a microscope? No. Have we studied it? No. We don't know. We just believe it. So the vast majority of life functions based on this kind of faith, taking people's word for, for something that, that they tell us. And so Jesus is picking up Thomas, not on the fact that he is looking for evidence, but the fact that he's looking for the wrong evidence. He wants the evidence of his five senses, what he can see and touch and taste. But Jesus is basically, I think the subtext, the hidden text, is Jesus is saying to him, why didn't you believe based on your friend's testimony? And indeed, the Christian faith hangs on testimony, written testimony, historical testimony. And our lives hang on testimony. You get on a plane because you have a friend who got on a plane and your parents got on planes and you've always believed that getting on planes is generally a safe thing to do and, you, and you're correct. Um, but we don't believe it because we understand Bernoulli's principle and we, uh, well some of us might, but we don't understand you know, the, the, the mechanics of an aeroplane and, and how, it's, how it's actually working and how it's wired and how to fix it if it goes wrong. We don't understand those things. We take it on faith. So I don't, I've always thought all my life that Jesus is correcting Thomas because he wants evidence, but I don't think that's the case. I, I think he's correcting Thomas because he wants the wrong sort of evidence, because he's not willing to believe the very powerful evidence that he has, 
which is 12, 11 of his best friends and all the ladies who are saying, yes, but it, I know it's impossible, but it's true. We've seen it, and this is not a joking matter. And Thomas says emphatically, I will not, never, I will never believe. So it's a very particular, hard-headed kind of resistance to truth. And you do find this in the world when you meet people, that you try really hard to present the evidence to people, and they will say, no, it's not true, because they hold on to their emotional attachment to an idea. So we read on in, in John uh, verses 26 to 29, it, this story continues on in your bulletin, a week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he says to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas now believes the evidence of his eyes. Uh, the story doesn't say he stuck his finger in the hole in his hand. And I've often pointed out to you that would be extremely crass. The irony is that all the Christian art down through the centuries that portray the scene has Thomas doing this. You've got Thomas sticking his finger in Jesus' side. Can you ever imagine that anybody would be so crass as to go and stick their finger in Jesus' side? That's what all the art shows. It just shows how art can miss, miss the point um, of the story. The point is when Jesus appears, he, he believes. He believes his eyes. He doesn't need to follow up with his touch as well. So there are different kinds of evidence. You can believe testimony, you can believe your eyes, you can believe your touch, uh, but you can also believe your, your ears and the, the testimony that people give you if they're reliable witnesses. Blessed are those who have not seen, Jesus says, and yet have come to believe. This is one of the most uh, misunderstood texts, I, I think, uh, in the scripture. All right. I've got ahead of myself, as usual. Um, so we can, we can know uh, a great deal about what happened through strong, early, widespread testimony. And it's because the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is strong, early, and widespread that even secular historians today take the resurrection more seriously than kids in school would imagine. And I want to explain two reasons why this is so. There are many uh, arguments for the resurrection, but today I just want to mention two reasons that secular historians take the resurrection of Jesus seriously. The resurrection of Jesus is a subject of serious historical study in the academy, in universities. And here are the two reasons why, two reasons, two of many reasons why. The first reason is the tomb was empty. The body was missing. It's the greatest cold case in history. Um, and this is a conclusion reached not by Christian believers who are influenced by fanciful fairy tales, but by those who don't believe in Christianity but who study history. There are a few reasons why historians believe the tomb was empty. One, it's mentioned in three different sources. Uh, and these are sources that haven't been copied from one another. So it's not one source copied from another, but three separate sources tell us that the tomb was empty. Secondly, we have good evidence that the, authority, the authorities in Jerusalem claimed that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body from the tomb. Now, whether you believe that, I don't believe that's true. The Christian account tells us that that was a lie that the authorities made up. But what it tells us is the tomb was empty. Even the enemies of Jesus said the tomb was empty, so much so that they had to come up with an explanation of why the tomb was empty, and their explanation was, well, somebody must have stolen the body, because that's the sort of logical conclusion. But actually, they didn't have evidence for that. Um, the third reason most scholars think that there was an empty tomb was that the first and central witnesses to the story were, were women. And as I've shared with you before, women were not considered reliable witnesses in a court of law in the first century. And so it's an embarrassing detail that the women were the first ones to the tomb and the first ones to believe in the resurrection. It's embarrassing. So the historical argument is historians say people don't write history with significantly embarrassing details about themselves. When people write history, they make themselves look good. So it's highly unlikely 
that the disciples would have written accounts making themselves look insensitive, dull, stupid, and slow to believe unless it was true. It's a, historic, it's a, it's a secular historical uh, argument. In last week's uh, Gospel reading, Easter reading, we read in John 20, verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. The first evangelist is not a man in the story. It's a woman who has a dodgy past. She's a woman of ill repute. She is the worst possible witness that you could find in the first century. And yet, the disciples don't whitewash her out of the story. They include her in the account. This is one of the reasons that historians think it's, it's an accurate account. You wouldn't, you wouldn't make it up, in other words. She tells them she has seen that he has said these things to her. He has spoken to her. So for historians, this is really significant. And you find the same thing in the other three Gospels. Women are, are the key witnesses to the resurrection. A professor of Jewish studies at Oxford University called Geza Vermes, Professor Geza, Geza Vermes, who is not a Christian, brings this point to a nice conclusion. He writes, from these various records, two convincing points emerge, one positive and the other negative. First, the women belonging to the entourage of Jesus discovered an empty tomb and were definitive that it was the tomb of Jesus. And secondly, the rumor that the apostles stole the body is most improbable. This is in his book, Jesus the Jew, published by Collins. So the tomb was empty. That's point number one for, his, for secular historians. But of course, an empty tomb can be explained in a number of different reasonable ways. So it's really the second piece of information that causes historians to puzzle over this story of the resurrection. And the second piece of information is, from the very beginning, people claimed in good faith to be eyewitnesses of the risen Christ in significant numbers. And it gave rise to the church, which has become the greatest movement of people in the history of the world. And in the early first century, the church was persecuted to the point of, of, of destruction. And yet they still maintained in the face of tremendous adversity, that they had seen the risen Lord, and they passed on that story. And the early church fathers write about the martyrs and about how they, they went to terrible deaths precisely because they had seen the risen Christ. It was, it was the resurrection that kept them going. You know, you think that the early Christians died martyrs' deaths because they were fanatics. It's not the case. They weren't fanatics. They weren't stupid people. Nobody goes to get boiled in oil or thrown to the lions or sawn in half if they don't have to. They were not that kind of fanatic. The early church fathers tell us they did this because they had seen the Lord or because they knew people who had seen the Lord. This was the heart, the engine of the early church faith that gave rise to the Christian movement. Uh, our evidence for there being eyewitnesses to these events is very strong. And there are three reasons the evidence is taken seriously by, again, secular historians. The first evidence for the people seeing, eyewitnesses seeing the risen Lord, is first-hand evidence. The first reason is that we have the testimony about people claiming to see the risen Jesus firsthand. John's Gospel is a good example. John is an eyewitness. He saw it himself, and he writes about it. So he's a first-hand eyewitness. Se secondly, uh, the second reason is that we have very early accounts close to the time. Um, this is not written hundreds of years later. This is not from the realm of mythology. Uh, in fact, John's Gospel, which is usually considered one of the later of the New Testament documents, was still written very close to the time of the events described. Closer in time to Jesus than our best biography, for example, of the Emperor Tiberius, who lived at the same time as Jesus. His earliest biography is written well after the biographies that were written of Jesus. The Gospel of John is very early in terms of ancient history. In fact, we have an extraordinary statement that most scholars think was composed within a few years of the events from 1 Corinthians 15, and I've often preached to you about that in the past, so I won't go over it today. It's very, very early evidence, eyewitness evidence. Thirdly, the evidence is sincere. So we have eyewitnesses firsthand, um, 
we, we have very early evidence and we have very sincere evidence. When you look into the academic literature, you find that most historical experts are convinced that the original witnesses were nothing if not sincere. They gave us their testimony in good faith. This is not a hoax. This is not a joke. These guys really laid their lives down for this. They really believed that they had seen the risen Lord. The reason they think that, that this is very straightforward, the original uh, witnesses gained nothing from their testimony, and as you know, they all died miserable deaths. Uh, it's, a tr it's a terrible litany to read out the, the many ways in which the disciples were put to death. Things like being skinned alive and boiled and filleted and so on, not really not very pleasant uh, things to, to, to talk about. Why would you die for something that you know is true or not? Why would you die if you know it's a lie? Now, people die for what they believe in. We call them zealots or martyrs. But people don't die for something that they know is a lie. It just doesn't happen. A uh, professor of Duke University, Ed Sanders, who is no friend of the Christian faith and doubts all sorts of things in the Gospels, he is, an he is an agnostic about the resurrection, but listen to what he writes. Professor Sanders from Duke says, I did not regard deliberate fraud, I do not regard deliberate fraud as a worthwhile explanation for the eyewitness accounts. Many of the people in the lists of witnesses were to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming that they had seen the risen Lord and several of them would die for their cause. The fact that Jesus' followers and later Paul had resurrection experiences is, in my judgment, remember this guy is a skeptic and a non-Christian, he says, the fact that Jesus' followers and Paul had resurrection experiences is, in my judgment, a fact. What the reality was that gave rise to those experiences, I do not know. Isn't that fascinating? The conclusion of the secular historians is the evidence is solid. The problem is, what do you do with it? They can't explain it. They can't bring themselves to conclude, well, maybe, maybe he did rise, because that's the, the logical conclusion. So they basically said, I, I can't explain it. And, and a number of scholars say this, a number of secular a non-Christian or skeptical scholars, they, they say this they're, because they're honest, you see. The facts lead us to the resurrection, but dead men don't rise, so we don't know what to say. He's an agnostic. He says something strange happened. The people really thought that Jesus was alive, but I just don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to make of it. And this is precisely where historical analysis leads us, leads us and it's where it leaves us. We then find ourselves in the realm of intuition, prejudice, upbringing, we have to decide what we do with this evidence. There is an empty tomb and there are multiple eyewitnesses claiming that they have seen the resurrected risen Lord alive and well and having breakfast or walking around talking. You see, what we do with that really depends on our life experience, our emotion, our prejudice, our upbringing. All of these play a part in how we decide whether or not we take this seriously. And this leads us to the final paragraph of today's gospel and to the question of significance. I told you evidence and significance. So now we come to the last paragraph on page four. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life, zoe, eternal life, in his name. The, the significance of the resurrection is this, eternal life. It's so that we may, be believe, we may believe and our sins may be forgiven and we may receive life through his name and through his sacrifice. The resurrection is God's proof and pledge that he can breathe new life where there is death. Easter unashamedly proclaims eternal life. This is the hope we have in the face of death. It brings perspective on our mortality in this life. It says death is not the end. It says Jimmy has hope because although his beloved mum has died, she has died in the faith of Christ, he has hope to be reunited with her again. This is not a vain hope. It's not an imaginary friend hope. It's a, it's a hope based on his solid historic evidence 
an eyewitness testimony from early on. I mentioned earlier the pandemic in 250 AD that went on for many years. Now, we call this pandemic the Cyprian pandemic of AD 250 to 260. Cyprian was 200 to 258. And we call it this because the best source of information about the pandemic comes from Cyprian, who was the Bishop of Carthage in North Africa at the time. He was a really important Christian leader in his world in the third century, and he wrote a lot during the pandemic. He described the symptoms and details of the disease, which scientists are very interested in today. But far more important than his descriptions of the disease was what he said to the church, his flock. He spoke about finding perspective in the midst of crisis, pandemic, and death. He drew upon John's gospel, the very passage we've just read today, to remind people that our hope is in the resurrection. It's not in the medicine or the treatment of the doctors. Ultimately, we will all die. Our hope is in the resurrection of Jesus. It's the promise that there is more to reality than the suffering of this life that we, that we see and hear. This is uh, what Cyprian wrote. Christ himself, our Lord and God, encourages us and says, I am the resurrection and the life. He's quoting John. He, he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall not die eternally. Cyprian goes on. If we believe in Christ, let us have faith in his words and promises. And since we shall not die eternally, let us come with a glad security unto Christ, with whom we are to conquer forever, conquer death. For death is not an ending, but a transition, a passage to eternity. This is a very striking passage from you know, 250, 260 AD speaking to us. It's a very modern message. The message is fresh and new. So the resurrection is not just significant for ancient times, it's eternally significant because it gives us hope throughout the ages. I want to conclude today with, I've shared with you this testimony before on this Sunday. It's a testimony of a man called James Garbett. James Garbett was a magistrate in the Australian courts in the state of New South Wales. And he came to church one day, which was out of character for him, and he revealed to the priest that he had a terrible cancer. And he's being confronted with his probable death. He felt that there were only two things that mattered to him at that time. Number one, what do you think they might be? What would matter to a man who's just had a sentence of death? Number one was his family. That's the great Aussie priority. And number two is the question of God. So he began an exploration of Christian faith. At first, his exploration was intellectual. He wanted to know the evidence, the philosophical arguments, and the history of Christianity. He realized soon that history is a lot like law, because both depend on testimony. And it dawned on him how many life and death decisions he had made for other people based only on testimony. He, he read the Gospels and he said, the Gospels are God's testimony to me. He said, I've been assessing testimony for decades and there is no way this stuff is made up. And at that point, there was a watershed moment for, when he moved from academic inquiry about the evidence of the resurrection to an inquiry as to the significance of it for him in his life. He had many questions, but he realized that the resurrection was the heart of the matter, and he came to realize that if Jesus had risen from the dead, then the resurrection was the guarantee of his own eternal life, which is exactly what John's Gospel says. So this man, James Garbutt, came to the point where he gave his life to Christ, and trusted in Jesus for his eternal salvation. As time went by, he got sicker and sicker, and a few days before he died, he prayed with his priest. Three days later, he died. And yet you can say now he is more alive than any of us. His funeral was a great event, packed with the great and the good from Sydney, from the legal fraternity, and lawyer after lawyer spoke and shared eulogies about James Garbutt. They said things like, James was a man of impeccable judgment. He was a great assessor of evidence. 
Well, James's judgment and his assessment of the evidence is that he came to trust in the gospel accounts that Jesus is our eternal hope. It was a great reminder that our faith is not just about history and evidence, because our faith and our doubts are far more than an intellectual assessment of what has happened. Over my course of my ministry, I've often met people who would tell me, I don't believe because my parents taught me not to believe. Or I don't believe because I prayed for a girlfriend in Form 12 and I didn't get the one I asked for. Uh, I've actually met people in their 30s who've said things like that to me. We have to look into our own hearts and let down the walls of our prejudices, our preference and our life experiences. And above all, listen to the promise at the heart of the resurrection history, the promise of eternal life, and assess the claim that if Christ is risen, then the promise for us is eternal life in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we, we ask that, unlike Thomas, we may listen with the ears of faith to those early testimonies which are so moving and convincing. And we ask that we may have a sure and certain faith even in the face of our own future demise, that we may hold fast to the end and that we may attain to the crown of eternal life. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you for your patience always, dear friends. Let us turn to page four in the uh, prayer book as we stand and affirm our faith in the words of the creed. We declare together... We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty. seated, dear friends, or, or Neil, if you prefer, as Donna comes to lead us in our intercessions this morning. Thank you, Donna. For our intercessions, we follow Form 3 on page 31. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacrament. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That the may find favor in your sight. Father, we pray for comfort for the family of Manong Jimmy and Manong Lisa for the passing of their dearly mom, and to Sir Ip and Wong family for the passing of Sir Ip's father. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Lord.
Lord, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Look not upon our sin, but upon the faith of the church, and give to us the peace and unity of the heavenly Jerusalem, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forevermore. Amen. As we come to break bread together, hear these words. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor as we pray the prayer on page 6. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Dear friends, hear these words of absolution. May Almighty God have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sin through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May we stand for the greeting of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. Peace be with you, Christ. Peace be with you, my team. Um, peace be with you. Thank you so much for again for coming. I just commend to you the notices in the bulletin. It's a bit like War and Peace today. As you can see, there's a lot of things going on. Um, I just want to mention that uh, after morning tea later, our uh, Philippine Fellowship here will have a, a bonding lunch together here in, in the courtyard. Uh, and um, you're welcome to stay. Um, the Filipino friends are welcome to stay. Um, and uh, part of that is to spend some time with Benida because after many, many years, Benida has been here longer than me, I believe. Is that right, Benida? I can't remember. It's so long ago. How long have you been here? Do you? 30 years. Lord have mercy. <laughs> You're either a woman of great character or a person of, of, of great determination and stickability, or both, I think. Um, thank you, Benita, for your faithful service for 30 years. I think, I think we should get her a gong or something. <laughs> this May, June, Benita will be heading back to retirement and to uh, her family in the Philippines. So it's coming soon. So um, we're going to, the ladies will spend time together to have fellowship. <coughs> and um, <coughs> I'm open to suggestions of how we, <coughs> sorry, the old asthma. I think we should do something to farewell the night. I think thirty years dissolves, deserves something more than a handshake. <laughs> so um, please, uh, please think about that. If you have any suggestion, let me know. Um, so I commend that to you, and I just encourage you to uh, have a look at the notices. We have men's group coming up, women's group. The men's group are having father and son night this Thursday. Do please join us if you can. Please RSVP and let me know if you're coming. Please bring your son. Uh, we have sons all the way through from little ones to teenagers coming. Um, and we're going to have a, a – Eddie is going to organize a football competition. So it's two against two, father and son um, uh, against uh, the others. So um, do please come along and um, oh, look, there's just so many things there. I just commit them all to you. Uh, we have men's group, young adults group. We have international ladies night on Saturday, um, youth group. On Sunday, we have the monthly Philippine Fellowship Bible study. They're doing excellent Bible studies in Matthew. Next Monday week is uh, Philippine Fellowship Labor Day gathering at Miss Anna's home. Um, all of these things you can read about uh, in the bulletin. 
I should also flag that the 8th of June is the Morrison Chapel 100th anniversary. Now, it's the 100th anniversary all year, so the Church Council can arrange other activities, but I thought at least what we should do is have a communion. So I proposed that on the Wednesday night, the 8th of June, we will have a Thanksgiving Eucharist. Now, because Morrison Chapel is little, we don't dare advertise it. We can't have 400 people turn up in the middle of June. It's too hot and too humid. And we did consider could we put chairs outside and all that, but I just think it's not a good idea. So we'll just advertise this in-house, and uh, you're all welcome to come and have communion with us to celebrate this 100 years of this building, 100 years of this building um, in the 8th of June. So that's really something to give thanks for. And we'll have a 100th birthday cake. In fact, the, in fact, the presence of a church here is over 200 years old, um, but the original church got eaten by white ants and the roof fell in, and it fell into terrible disrepair at one time. At one time, it was used as a fireworks storage place, apparently, and uh, it's had a very interesting, colourful history. And we'll hear more about that on the night, uh, on the 8th of June. So, uh, and uh, it would be good to get some decoration happening that night, to have some balloons, and so we can have a little uh, celebration ourselves here. But I just propose to do that in-house. We, we can't cater for children. We can't cater for hundreds of people. It's going to be stinky, hot and humid, so I just don't see any way that we can advertise it to the whole world. So uh, don't bring your friends. <laughs> All right. I will let the church council think of The Philippine Fellowship is planning a birthday party in November, December, uh, which we will invite everybody to uh, later in the year when the weather's better. And then we can go outside uh, when it's past typhoon season and have an out. Uh, we, what we'd like to do is have a combined service with 9 and 11 together here, maybe at 10 a.m. or something. And everybody can sit outside and we'll pray it won't rain. Last time we did that, it rained. <laughs> About 10 years ago, we had a combined service and it rained cats and dogs. Anyway, best laid plans of mice and men. Uh, in the bulletin, there's a mistake on page 10. It says that we're praying for New Guinea on the 17th of April. That should, of course, be today. Uh, we're praying for the church in Papua New Guinea. They need a lot of prayer. So please keep them in your prayer. Let us uh, sing our offertory hymn, which is number 414, uh, the traditional let us break bread together. Let us break bread.
page 8, let us offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good our promises to the Most High. We pray together, yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you. The Lord be with you.
but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Dear friends, the gifts of God for the people of God, his body broken and his blood shed. Let us take them in remembrance that Christ died for us, and let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do, as always, invite you to join with us at the Lord's table today. The body of Christ can keep you in eternal life. The body of Christ can keep you in eternal life. Dear friends, let us hear the word of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We turn to page 25 in the prayer book. As we give thanks for these mysteries, we pray together saying, Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear, the, hear these words of blessing. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for coming today, dear friends. The Lord bless you. I hope you'll have a fruitful and happy week ahead um, in the service of the Lord. Let us sing our closing hymn. I propose we sing three verses, verses 1, 2, 3.
Um, oh, hallelujah, sing to Jesus. Hallelujah, let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.